series of conversations with artists about becoming full-time in their field. This week, our guest is guitarist Brian Mullen. Brian is a graduate of Berklee School of Music and has been playing and performing for 43 years and teaching for 22. In addition to teaching, he's also the band leader and guitar player in the bands Sweetwater Junction and Billy Bat's Jazz Ensemble. He's also a hired gun for many different bands and also does studio sessions and production work for bands and artists. He's written and sold songs to Microsoft, Home Depot, and the Atlanta Braves, among others, and has had many placements for TV and professional sporting events, including NASCAR, NBA, the NFL, and the NHL. Brian has a deep interest in the development of young artists and a wish to encourage their creativity through music. He teaches guitar at his home in Roswell, Georgia, and at Maple Street Guitars, and he also has a YouTube channel called Guitar Practice Skills. We spoke with Brian about being a full-time guitarist and what that reality looks like for him. I first picked up a guitar when I was nine years old. Uh, I was I was uh, in fifth grade, and at that point uh, we had moved to Clemson, South Carolina. And we moved into a neighborhood where there were a lot of kids playing guitar. And there were kids my age playing guitar, and there were kids in middle school and high school playing guitar, bass, drums, all that stuff. So there was only one uh, music store in town. So uh, my mom, uh, my parents bought me an gu acoustic guitar. Uh, coincidentally enough, I'm getting ready to get that guitar back. It was just found, so my sister has it, and I'm about to have it in my possession again, which I'm psyched about. Um, but, so I started taking lessons. My neighbor, uh, was a big Beatles guy, and I started learning Beatles songs. And this was in fifth grade, and we kind of had a little Beatles cover band. You know, there, there were like four or five guys that played acoustic guitar, and then everybody tried to sing. So it was, uh, you know, it was pretty funny and, and a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And so within six months after starting taking lessons, I was in a band, basically, you know, or at least playing with kids and friends. And then uh, when we felt real brave, we would knock on the high school kids door and uh, see if they'd let us hang out and watch them play because they were already way better than we were. So we were always trying to, you know, cop stuff off of other people, learn, watch how they play, those things. I mean, back in the 70s, what you have to understand is, is basically every neighborhood in America, everybody had bands, everybody was playing guitar, bass, drums, skateboarding, uh, riding bikes, you know, all that stuff. But everybody was playing. Uh, you pro there was probably not one neighborhood where you couldn't at least find one player. So there was a lot of competition. So it was very important that you become very good on the, your instrument. You know, it was much more important back then. The first time I got paid as a professional musician um, I was actually playing bass in a punk band called Board Suburban Youths. 
And most likely I probably made about $10 for the gig. But um, those gigs were not about money. They were about having fun. <laughs> construction, I did roofing, I did landscaping, uh, I worked for a plumber, um, I bartended, I waited, uh, I washed dishes. <laughs> after high school, actually when I was playing in BSY, in, in the punk band, uh, even though I was playing more bass than guitar, but, you know, we were out driving around, you know, the, the southern region, you know, playing crazy gigs, uh, you know, having a lot of fun, but especially back then with the hardcore and the punk, nobody was making money. You know, so even the big bands, like, I mean, Black Flag at their height, they were making very little money. And really until, I think it was, what was it, Green Day and Blink-182, they started making big money. But um, basically at that point, I was thinking maybe I could do this. But I had to get a lot more serious about it. And that's why I ended up going to Berkeley. Um, well, it, it, being in a hardcore band in the 80s was more fun than you could possibly ever imagine. And that's what it was all about, was having fun. And whether we knew it or not, you know, being 18 years old, um, not too many cares in the world, you're immortal at that point, so you're just getting in a van and you're going. And you play these gigs and you meet so many great people. Um, you know, in each town there were kind of, you know, uh, the DIY setups, you know, there were crash houses. Um, you just knew everybody in every town, wherever you played, and there were always the, you know, probably the smaller towns were the ones where everybody was even hungrier for live music. So, um, I mean, one of the shows we played, we played with the Melvins and uh, RKL, Rich Kids on LSD, and Christ on Parade, and I can't remember who else was there, but but we played that show, and it was a particularly amazing show. Um, I mean, the guitar players for RKL were in the air more than they were on the stage. I mean, really incredible playing. Uh, we met uh, the Melvins. I mean, it's incredible. We were playing hacky sack out back and the Melvins pull up and they're just in this shitty van and um, somebody had taken like a Sharpie or like black paint or something and painted all the faces of Kiss on the side of their van and Buzz gets out and he's got a cowboy hat on and like Lemmy shorts, super short shorts and cowboy boots. And then we started playing hacky sack, you know, we, and he was like that. And um, that show, there was a riot at the show. Uh, I witnessed a girl's femur getting broken in the mosh pit that you could hear over the band break. That was probably one of the wildest things uh, we saw. Um, we played in a uh, cornfield in, uh, what town, what's the name of that town? The town near Myrtle Beach, uh, Florence, Florence, South Carolina. We played in a cornfield in the barn with DRI. That was, uh, rich. Let's say that. That was, uh, uh, pretty 
wild also. There's actually video of that somewhere. There might be on YouTube or something. Um, but, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the crazy things were just how the locals would look at you when you get out of the van or, you know, the, all the run-ins with the police, you know, uh, whether you get stopped or at shows. And I mean, every, it, it was wild, but it was also, we made a lot of friends, a lot of friends that I still stay in touch with, you know, to this day. Um, but it was just the beginning of the adventure. <laughs> I was living in Columbia, South Carolina. I uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do specifically, but had just been playing music. Uh, was probably the biggest thing I was doing and spending most of my time doing. And I hadn't gone to college yet when all of my friends had gone to college at University of South Carolina, Clemson, all those schools. And so I decided to go to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. So I moved up to Boston in 1992 and then got my degree from Berkeley School of Music and graduated in 1996. Well, I graduated, but I was really sick. I had, uh, at that time, I had contracted Lyme disease in my senior year at Berkeley. So after I got out of school, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, but I was really sick at the time and ha didn't really have a diagnosis yet. So I'm, I played in some bands and then um, also worked part-time jobs at that time. Actually, what I did first was I got a teaching job at a music store and was teaching guitar lessons on the side and then just kind of uh, playing uh, whatever band with whatever band that would hire me. I was kind of like a side man at that point. So I was making some money playing, but I also uh, started to make money uh, teaching. actually catering. Um, I was working for a caterer and this was probably in 96 and I got this job teaching guitar at uh, Buckhead Music um, and I just got enough students where I was like I'm quitting my other job and just started uh, being able to float the boat just teaching and playing obviously but but what, at that point, I wasn't making consistent income playing. And I was still uh, sick at that point, too. For me, uh, being a professional gu guitarist, uh, I was pre-coronavirus, pre-COVID-19, um, I was uh, running a wedding band, a corporate band. Um, we pro probably played 50 to 75 gigs a year, a lot of traveling, and uh, was also teaching. So I was teaching 50 to 70 students a week at my busiest, and then uh, traveling pretty much every weekend you know, running this band and playing these types of dates and uh, which was actually great money. But it, it runs you ragged. The travel, no matter what level you're on, the travel is what gets everybody pretty much. Well, I have 
have the uh, band Sweetwater Junction, and that's the wedding band. And originally when that band started, uh, it was basically five guys back in around 2000, you know, and uh, at that point we still wanted to do original stuff. I mean, it was kind of like a, a jam band at that point, but then we all of a sudden, all our wives got pregnant and we needed to start thinking about making uh, real money. And we were playing this gig at Peachtree Tavern in Buckhead and this girl came stomping up on stage uh, in between songs and she looked at me and uh, said, you're going to play our wedding. And I said, really? And it kind of went from there. So it was kind of synchronization as far as we all needed to make more money. And we ended up playing this couple's uh, wedding. And then we got five weddings out of that wedding and just kind of went from there. And that's how that whole thing started. You know, I learned a lot from, from running the band. I mean, it's been 18 years running that band and you know we made a lot of money and you definitely learn how to deal with people oh yeah yeah definitely well i mean i always do i mean i write i've always i've um depending on how busy i am i'm able to write i found when I actually was sick, I wrote a lot more because I had a lot more free time and was constantly depressed. So that that's uh, that's great grounds for some good writing right there. So uh, when I had a lot of free time, but I found the busier I got with teaching in the band, there's just too much chatter in, in my brain and started having a lot of trouble writing. And I'm starting to come out of that now because I'm not near as busy. I have a lot more free time, even though I'm teaching a lot. So I'm back riding again. So yes, I, I definitely want to uh, get back on a more original type medium. <laughs> out there these days um the 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 bands or the singers um are the ones really making all the money it's the the bands are not doing as well these days as the singers and that's for a lot of reasons these days people are just not making as much money as they used to uh with the whole streaming platform so uh, people that maybe back in the day would make millions of dollars are now making thirty to sixty thousand dollars a year off of it. So it's more of a, a, a regular type income these days for a lot of a lot of artists. And the main way a lot of these uh, uh, artists and a, a few guitar players too are making their money they're actually endorsed by corporations. So like uh, Gary Clark Jr. would be one that I can think of. He's He's got endorsements with corporations. So they're actually making more money that way than on their music, you know? So just because of the way the music business is set up now. Their YouTubers are making more money off their YouTube channels than they are off their original music in a lot of cases. <laughs> Well, we lost all our gigs in the band uh, for basically the busy season was just cranking up in March. Um, we've lost all our gigs from March until August at this point. And that was basically every weekend being booked uh, and some weekday gigs too. 
So we've lost a lot of gigs, um, but I've been able to teach uh, guitar lessons on Zoom. So I'm still able to uh, float the boat or make enough money to get by. <laughs> These days? Yes, be honest. <laughs> um, these days, if somebody told me they wanted to be a professional guitarist, I would have to sit down and have a real serious conversation with them. Um, I think if someone wants to be a professional musician, they probably need to be schooled. They probably should go to Berkeley or something, you know, uh, uh, Juilliard or University of Miami or wherever. Um, but they also should have something on the backup, you know, as far as something else, because these days people are just not making as much money as they used to. <laughs> I see myself coming up post-COVID, hopefully post-COVID soon. Um, I see myself closing down the band, the wedding band, um, and getting back to more writing and uh, recording. I'd like to get more into production too, which I had done in the past, but kind of the way the music business has been it's kind of been iffy. Can you make it as a, a small time producer, you know, but you supplement everything together. I mean, I'll, I'll probably always teach guitar lessons. And then uh, if I get back into uh, originals and original band, I will be much happier. Nice. <laughs>